core message of our Think I campaign is that participating in the census is safe and secure for all Californians. So I just want to underscore that uh, because the data that you provide, no one can get access to your private information. It's protected by Title 13, uh, and not even the president can access your private data. I will say that on the data front, uh, when people say, well, why is data so important? Well, right now, data does drive emergency funding. Um, for all of us that are probably glued to uh, the TVs and to our uh, mobile feeds to see what's going on, uh, just know that being counted, uh, having the data to know where everybody is and what those numbers of people are out there is very important uh, towards our emergency response that the governor and his his key um, departments are undertaking. So I just want to underscore um, that the Census Bureau um, does use the information to make sure that every state and community gets its fair share of resources, but that, again, they're not going to share it. Uh, the Census Bureau um, is has delayed some of their operations due to the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. And I'd like to let you all know that we are closely monitoring the novel coronavirus through COVID-19 here in California. So while my expertise lies mainly in census outreach matters, I can say that the state of California is acting quickly to protect public health and safety in response to COVID-19. And the California Department of Public Health is continually updating its website. So that's a really great place to go to um, to find out about the stay-at-home orders. Um, and we've also set up our own website to update our partners in the public, which is available at census.ca.gov slash COVID-19. But I just want you to know um, that the health and safety of our partners uh, and our residents of California is of the utmost importance. And that's why I think it's important to get the word out that you can respond to the census from the safety of your home online or over the phone or uh, in the weeks to come via mail. And we really encourage folks to do that because we don't want anybody coming to knock on your doors. Um, but in light of the situation, um, I think that every Californian can respond to the census without having to put anyone in danger. Um, as I mentioned, we're working with our trusted messengers to get the word out. And I, again, thank them. I thank them. I hope they know I thank them all the time. <laughs> Uh, not only for the years of effort that they put in coming up to this, but how they are adjusting now. Um, they're still letting our hardest to companies know how quick and easy it is. So I want to uh, underscore that the challenges we face now are even more complex than they were. And in the spirit of our campaign, we're working uh, closely to make sure that everyone is safe and that we're doing some creative stuff. So. As we commemorate Census Day with activities throughout the week, um, we're eager as ever to remind Californians um, how important it is and what it means to our community. So I'd like to um, turn it over uh, to June from Asian Americans Advancing Justice, and then we'll also hear from, hear from Boston in just a little bit. Edith, thank you. This is Sandy. I do have one. I. What are you... Um, what would you say is the message to people that resonates most effectively? It may depend on what groups you're talking to, but you've been out there pitching the census since 2017 mm -hmm. amidst fear, amidst distrust, amidst, amidst apathy and ignorance. What do you count on most to get through the din? Well, you know, I always, I take it very personally in terms of uh, the impact of if you don't, if you don't respond. Uh, I have a 16-year-old daughter and her freshman year, she had to sit on the floor during her math class because they didn't have enough seats. And that, you know, she came home and she's like, gosh, mom, that really relates to, you know, someone didn't fill out their census form, you know, in 2010 because they didn't, they didn't do the right planning. They didn't have the data that they needed to plan for that public school. Another um, more personal um, example is uh, when I was younger, I was about 10, I remember my best friend's dad got taken to the hospital. Like he, he I think he had a 
stroke or, you know, when you're 10, you don't really know, but he got taken away in an ambulance and we were super worried. And, you know, I didn't have a great understanding of being 10, but what I heard later was he had to travel a lot farther to get to an emergency room. And if there was an emergency room a lot closer, he might've suffered less damage. They would have been able to get to them. So when you think about, Oh, why do they have, why do I have to answer? And I'm going to tell you that it's, it's just nine questions that they're asking you. Um, but the data is really used for a number of things. It is used for, you know, where are we going to, you know, where should we for health planning have those clinics? Where should we have emergency rooms? Where should we have fire stations? Right. Where, how many, you know, schools do we need to build? So I just, um, want people to know that although data seems kind of boring and it's numbers, it truly has an impact on our everyday lives. Um, and that's why I push so hard. And that's why I come back. I have other jobs in between. <laughs> I don't just do this like full time. I come back every 10 years, every decade because of what it means for our community. So that's just on just the services side in terms of being able to have political representation in, in Washington, D.C., some of these national debates, those bills are lost on one or two votes. And if California loses a congressional seat to North Carolina or Texas, I can't even imagine the impact it could have on some really important national policies, uh, including, you know, health care. So, um, you know, I want people to understand that, you know, sharing this personal data which is like your name, your age, your gender, uh, whether you rent or own the home, um, and your race and ethnicity and your race. You're, they're not asking you, they will never ask you for any financial data. They'll never ask you for your social security number. They won't ask you for banking data. They're not asking you about your citizenship status. So I just appeal to folks out there, can you answer those nine questions? Right? Can you make sure everyone in your household, even if they're not related to you, if they're foster kids, or as you mentioned, you know, you live in a, a sort of an extended household, right? If you have a granny unit in the back, make sure if they they don't receive an actual invitation that you count them as well, even if they're you know renters, because everyone who's missed for they say at a at a conservative guess. For every person that's missed in California, it's like thousand dollars per year over a decade. That's ten thousand. So if you miss a million people, gosh, do the math on that. Is that a billion dollars that doesn't come back to California? And where does it go? To other states. And I'm kind of tired of donating to other states. So I take pride yeah. in being a Californian in our community. Thank you. I I I think why you prank is that census champion of California. Thank you. Now we'll um, go, delighted to have June Mim of Asian Americans Advancing Justice. June. Great. Thank you, Sandy and Didis. Um, hello, my name is June Lim, and I am the Demographic Research Project Director at Asian Americans Advancing Justice Los Angeles, a nonprofit legal aid and civil rights organization serving Asian American, Native Hawaiian, and Pacific Islander community. We are the statewide organization lead for outreach to ensuring a complete count of the Asian American, Native Hawaiian, and Pacific Islander communities here in California. Thank you for having me as part of this important call. Asian Americans, Native Hawaiians, and Pacific Islanders are considered hard to count. Among characteristics that are typically considered hard to count include racial and ethnic minorities, people with limited English proficiency, immigrants, refugees, older adults, people with language barriers, and lack of trust in government and what the government will do with their information. According to, 2020, according to the 2020 Census Barriers, Attitudes, and Motivator Study, Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders were least likely to respond to the 2020 Census and they were most concerned that the Census Bureau would not keep their answers confidential and that the Census Bureau will share their answers with other government agencies. So given these, these um, challenges and barriers, what are we doing about this? Together with our four Advancing Justice affiliate organizations across the U.S. and our 11 partners throughout the state of California, Advancing Justice Los Angeles is pushing for an accurate count of our community amid the disruption to census activities caused by the COVID-19 pandemic. 
We understand the concern in everyone's mind to remain healthy. And for that reason, we are strongly encouraging our communities to respond online, over the phone, or by mail. Among other languages, our community members are able to complete the census online or by phone in Chinese, Japanese, Korean, Tagalog, and Vietnamese. Additionally, the Census Bureau has printed visual language guides available in 59 language options and video guides to completing the census online in 63 languages. A, a really great overview. Thank you so much, June. Um, our next speaker and, and our last speaker is Basim Elkara of CARE. Basim. Yeah, Council on American Islamic Relations. It's a national civil rights and advocacy organization. Uh, we're running statewide for Nina, that's Middle East and North Africa, uh, which includes some of the hardest to count populations. We have dozens of partners in every part of the state. Um, we're also part of the Yalla Kao Mien, which is run by the Arab American Institute in Washington, D.C. Um, also, And some of the highlights um, that of, our, of the work of our partners, um, Right in Iranian has launched a national campaign to make sure to make it simple for Middle Eastern communities, which have a challenge because uh, the Middle Eastern communities are Canada's white. And so there's a, there, there tends to be a lot of confusion about that. So we've been trying to make it simple uh, for, for how to fill out the census uh, to, to lessen the confusion. And then the Writing Complete Count Committee has launched a campaign using influencers, um, creating videos in, in Farsi, and we're getting that out um, through social media and other avenues, especially the, 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 the Farsi TV stations and radio stations um, in Southern California. Uh, PANA Partnership for the Advancement of New Americans in San Diego has created a refugee hub at, um, with, with over a dozen organizations uh, targeting Amina, Somali, many communities that, that, live in, that live in the San Diego region and to make sure that all the materials have been translated as well as robust home banking um, targeting those communities by folks that speak their languages. When someone speaks that language, um, there's, there's trust that, that, that gets built and it makes it easier to do outreach for census. That people will take our communities more seriously when, when they see the actual numbers. Uh, for example, in the Armenian community, there's about 1.5 million Armenians in the U.S., uh, but they're only counted as 500,000 in the census. In California, we have about a million Armenians, only 250,000 are counted. So when you, you show a higher number of community members, um, elected officials and others take our, will take our communities more seriously. Thank you. Thank you. Um, a final note to all the media on the line today.